Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, we are delighted to have Alicia Kalar with us today from JQI at the University of Maryland. Um, Alicia did her undergrad at Princeton and then came to grad school here at the University of Illinois but was only here for a year before she moved uh, with Ben Lev out to Stanford. Um, she then did a postdoc at Princeton again, um, and then joined the faculty at the University of Maryland uh, last year. So uh, she's gonna be telling us about band engineering for quantum simulation and circuit QED. Before I let her begin, I want to advertise next week's talk, same time, same place. Um, Yelena Vukovic is gonna be telling us about color centers in diamond and silicon carbide as qubits. Um, and remember, as always, please put your questions in the chat. All right, take it away, Alicia. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks everyone for being here to listen. Um, and so let's get started. So the basic outline of my talk is that I will start by trying to introduce the, the system that I work with, namely coplanar waveguide lattices and superconducting qubits. And so I'll give an introduction to so what these systems are and what their unique capabilities are. And then in the latter part of my talk, I'll give sort of the middle part, two examples of how we harness the unique capabilities of the system to make synthetic materials that we wouldn't otherwise be able to have in the lab. And then hopefully I'll have a little bit of time at the end to show you some preliminary data from interacting devices as opposed to the somewhat more theoretical portions in the, of the earlier part of the talk. So what do we work with? So it's a circuit QED lab, so everything is microwave. Um, and our favorite workhorse is this thing here. This is the coplanar waveguide resonator. It's basically a two-dimensional analog of a coaxial cable. So it has one central conductor and two ground planes on either side. And if you cut the center pin, then you can make a high Q cavity with voltage and current waves bouncing back and forth between these two mirrors. And so we get a very one dimensional cavity. Um, in practice, it looks more like this. So they're big and long by microfabrication standards. And so we actually put these meanders in typically to compactify the whole thing. And the fact that you can do this is actually going to turn out to be really key to some of the fun lattice examples that I'll show you later. Um, just to put up a Hamiltonian, this is a harmonic oscillator, just like you're used to, except that instead of position and momentum, the corresponding degrees of freedom are charge and generalized flux. Let's move the laser pointer away. Um, and so this is our favorite object, but it's a harmonic oscillator, so it's not complicated enough or intricate enough by itself to do a lot of things. And so we need one more ingredient, and for us, that's the superconducting qubit. Um, this is a schematic of the most common type that's in existence right now, the transmon qubit. So it, what it is, is a capacitor in parallel with one or maybe two Josephson junctions. <clears throat> and at the Hamiltonian level, you can really think of it as an anharmonic oscillator. So instead of the phi squared term that we had before, there's a cosine phi. And that gives you an anharmonicity or a nonlinearity. Um, the transmon limit of this circuit is, in fact, where this EJ coefficient is much larger than EC. And so the, the intuitive way to think about this circuit is actually as a particle in a cosinusoidal well. So it has many different bound states, and there's a small anharmonicity due to this EC term. But if you're careful not to drive too fast or too hard, you can isolate these lowest two levels into an effective spin a half system, and that is actually the transmon qubit. Um, and so we can make these lithographically <clears throat> and actually just fabricate them directly inside the cavity. And when you do that, you get usually this uh, James Cummings Hamiltonian. So you have a harmonic oscillator description of the cavity, an effective spin and a half for the qubit, and this James Cummings interaction term where the photons in the cavity can exchange energy. And so this here move that out of the way, is a schematic of what the coupled energy levels look like. So by itself, the cavity is completely harmonic, but when you couple it to the qubit, each of these levels splits into doublets, where the, the size of the splitting depends on the number of photons. And so this is very qualitatively the kind of spectrum that we're working with, 
and it can be viewed in two qualitatively different ways. So the first is the more traditional <clears throat> quantum computing paradigm, where we can decide that the qubits are actually the system of interest for us. And then in that case, what the cavity does is it isolates the qubit from the rest of the electromagnetic environment and gives us a very well-defined sort of bus channel for routing signals to and from the qubit. But we can also think of this the other way around, that it's actually the photon degrees of freedom that we're interested in. And then in that case, what we have over here is a photonic system where the energy levels depend on the number of photons. So it's not harmonic anymore. And so this is actually essentially interacting photons with an interaction that is endowed by the presence of the qubit. And so this is sort of the pictures that we have to work with. Um, and it's very easy to understand in the single cavity regime. And so what I work on is basically trying to take this into more and more interesting places by making the photonic degrees of freedom more and more interesting and subtle. <clears throat> And in particular, I like to think about photonic lattices. And so for me, this is what a lattice looks like. This is a photograph of a chip that was fabricated in the Hauk lab once upon a time. <clears throat> and so each of these little squiggles here is a coplanar waveguide resonator, and they each meet at these invisible little black dots. So if we zoom in, this is what the junction region looks like. And so this is the center pins of three different cavities coming together at one spot where there's a particularly large capacitance and that allows microwave photons that are rattling around in one cavity to hop over to either of the two other ones. And so we can actually think about this device as a tight binding solid for photons. So the on-site energy is given by the resonator frequency and then <clears throat> whenever the resonator endpoints touch photons can hop from one cavity into the other with a hopping rate whose magnitude is given by the capacitance of this junction area. Um, it has one minor oddity, which is that the hopping is negative. So there's a few too many minus signs, but what this really means is that things that you expect to be low energy modes, long wavelength things are actually at high energy in this system. So the entire band structure is upside down from your molecule or solid state intuition that the bonding orbital should be the ground state. So everything is upside down, but that's just a global minus sign. In addition to this minus sign, there are two really qualitatively unique features about these lattices. <clears throat> Sorry. So the first is that these resonators are in a sense deformable. So what do I mean by that? So here's a picture of the CAD for one of our resonators. So it's this meandering waveguide with the two coupling regions on either side. And the key is that the frequency of this thing depends on how long the waveguide is, not how far away the endpoints are, but really how long the waveguide is. And the hopping rate, it comes entirely from these end regions and not from some central attractor and then tails of the wave function. And when you combine that with the fact that we can fabricate this waveguide in any shape that we want, you get a resonator that can be the same in multiple different shapes. So these are three very different looking CADs for a resonator that can have the same hopping and the same resonance frequency. And so that allows us to take our lattice site and sort of fit it into different amounts of space without changing it. Um, and so I want to take a look at a sort of toy example for what this buys us. So this is my cartoon for the potential of a regular square lattice. And if I make a disordered square lattice by displacing all of the atoms, then this is the potential that I get. And in the type binding limit, what I want to do is replace these two continuum potentials with a graph model. So for the regular lattice, this is almost certainly how you would draw it. So you have one node for every lattice site, and you put a complex variable on this node that's the amplitude and the phase of the wave function on that site, and you have an edge between the nodes if there's a hopping matrix element. For the disordered lattice, I get something like this, 
where I've drawn all the nodes in the same places. And now the difference is that if I have two lattice sites like these two that are close together, I should have a large hopping matrix element indicated in red and two lattice sites like those two that are far away, I should have a small matrix element indicated in yellow. And so now my question for the audience is, what about this graph? What about this model? What's it? Um, it's a weird one because it has the same site positions as the disordered lattice on the right, but it has all of the same bonds as the regular lattice on the left. And so in fact, it's not the disordered graph at all because all of the hoppings are equal. Despite how funny it looks, it's exactly, exactly the same as this regular version of the type binding model. And this is really an inherent property of a type binding model that the only information in it is who's connected to whom and how strongly. And so even though we started with this continuum lattice model now at the graph level, the only thing that matters is connectivity. And this is what the deformability of these coplanar waveguide resonators buys us, is that we really just have connectivity and we can make a distorted version of the lattice like this one here. Now, for a square lattice, this is a silly thing to do. This one's much easier. But there are some lattices where a nice regular version like this is actually not possible to make in the lab. And the only thing that we could make is a disordered version like this. And that's actually going to be the key for all the hyperbolic lattices that I'll talk about in the, the middle of my talk. <clears throat> so having this deformability. And then the other strange property of these lattices, sorry about that, is that the lattice site itself is one dimensional instead of point like. So if we zoom in on the device and try to see what lattice it is, your eye probably picked out the same hexagonal lattice that I've just drawn here, right? But I have lied and I have done something bad because what I have done here is I've drawn a lattice that implies that the particles live here and that the edges on the resonators are the hoppings. And that does not describe what happens to photons in this device. Instead, photons in this device move like this, that the particles live on the resonators and they can hop if the resonators share an endpoint. And so when I look at a device like this, there are sort of two lattices that I can think about. So the first I will call the layout graph, which right now all that it does is describe the connectivity of the hardware, where all of the resonators actually are. And if I want to think about what happens to photons, then I need to think about an effective lattice, which in this case is a Kagome-like object. And this turns out to be a mathematical object called a line graph. And line graphs have many very special properties, which we're going to exploit to make lots of fun systems later on. Okay, so that was the end of my sort of whirlwind introduction to coplanar waveguide lattices. So this is maybe a good spot to, to pause for questions if there are any. There are none in the chat, but I have one. Okay. So uh, when you drew your deformed lattice, but with the same hoppings, um, like what you have when you make your different shaped things, the, uh, the space between your resonators feels like it should be the length of the resonator, not the physical actual space between the resonators. Because what matters is like the half length for the photon. Yes. Not and so this is absolutely right, that you need to make sure that regardless of how long, say, this bond is, you put a resonator whose total arc length is equal. OK. Um, and so I think that the key point that I was trying to make is that this can be done with a resonator by making the meander bigger, for example. Whereas if I have two atoms and I bring them closer together, there's essentially nothing I can do to keep that hopping matrix element from going up. Okay. Thank you. Um, hello. I, I had some questions. Um, yeah. So uh, more on a practical standpoint, uh, the pictures that you keep showing us of the fractal-like or the lattice 
the lattices, mm -hmm. are they um, connected at the edges to like a um, another coplanar waveguide or do they extend farther than what the image shows? So are those true edges on the edge of the picture or um, does, the, does the lattice continue? So this particular one, this is the entire chip. And so the lattice stops at this point. Um, and then usually we connect it to a few coplanar waveguides to get signals in and out. I see, I see. And then wow. when you're calculating, so you have to calculate the inductance and capacitance of each of these elements, of each of these resonators, right? Um, do you do Roughly. that just with like a, with a basic formula, like you take the length, or do you do it with like finite element analysis? Um, so at the moment, we basically, we use the, the straight waveguide formulas. Mm -hmm. So we say, what's the total length? Um, and then if we want to make something a little bit more intricate than this, we have to worry a little bit about corrections from the bends and from any parasitic capacitance. And unfortunately, so far, I have not been able to get finite element type solvers to really give a good answer for those corrections. So okay. some of that, unfortunately, has to be done by hand. It's I, one of I see. some sides. That's actually kind of what I'm working on right now. So that's, uh, it's interesting to hear that uh, I'm not alone. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, I mean, so, so the problem is that you have an eight gigahertz resonator and you want the finite element to tell you the frequency of it to within a megahertz. Right. And yeah. a coplanar waveguide is not a friendly geometry for a, a finite element. The aspect ratio is horrible. Right, right. And then, okay, final question. Um, are, is the inductance of these resonators strictly geometric or do you have kinetic inductance in the materials that you use? So these guys are essentially all geometric. Um, okay. So they're made from niobium and they're made with pretty big fat center pins, 20 microns. Okay. Um, we have done some experiments where we made it from something with kinetic inductance with a much smaller center pin. Um, and that's sort of a different beast. Okay. All right. Thank you. All righty. So now I want to show you how we can actually exploit the fact that we have these deformable resonators and we make line graphs and how do we use this to produce sort of interesting photonic environments for our qubits to live in. Um, and so first I'm going to give you an example of what we can do by harnessing this deformability. Um, and so we sat around the lab thinking, once we realized that we had these deformable resonators, we were thinking, well, what, what does this allow us to do? And essentially what it allows you to do is to make something that's curved, but lives on a flat substrate. And so we got excited about this idea, you know, because it has potential connections to general relativity. We're like, okay, can we make something in the lab that looks like a curved space time? also has connections to 2D materials, something like ripples in graphene or fullerene molecules. And this is what got us started on along these lines. And sort of there's two possible curvatures that we could try to implement, positive spherical curvature or negative hyperbolic. Spherical curvature we're all familiar with. Um, hyperbolic is actually much harder to realize and mathematically much more intricate. And so that's where we started. And so if you look at hyperbolic spaces, they're actually related to open questions in modern mathematics. So a tree is hyperbolic. Um, it's really a challenge. With respect to these, they're also a favorite in computer science. Um, it's kind of interesting to see actually that there are a few communications scenarios where a hyperbolic network outperforms anything else that you could have. So if you want to collect, connect a lot of nodes efficiently to a few central servers, then that needs to be hyperbolic and tree-like. Also, if you want to make a network that cannot be cut in half by severing a small fraction of the links, turns out that that actually must be hyperbolic. There's absolutely no way to do it with a Euclidean lattice or a Euclidean type geometry. And then we also found a paper that the structure of the internet was a hyperbolic lattice. And so between all of these things, we got very excited and said, all right, we're gonna do this. We're gonna figure out how to do this in the lab. 
And the challenge, of course, is that we need to take a non-flat thing and smash it down onto a substrate. And so if I think about how to make a lattice, we're all familiar with Euclidean ones. So this is my favorite example, graphene. I pick a tile and I pick a tiling. And once I do that, if I've chosen well, as soon as I can do one vertex, I can just keep on going to infinity. That's sort of the characteristic of a nice valid flat lattice. Um, in a spherical space, oops, there's a similar tiling where instead of hexagonal plaquettes, you use pentagonal plaquettes, and I've started to draw it here. And already at the level of the single vertex, I've run into a problem because these two corners are the same lattice site and they're not in the same place. And so the only way to get the connectivity right is to stretch things out. And so this is my cartoon of a flattened soccer ball and things are much longer out here on the edges than they are in the middle. And this is really taking something curved, making it flat. There's no way to do it without messing up the distances. Um, hyperbolic space is harder to get intuition for because it basically doesn't fit in 3D. Um, so what I would say is the best way to think about it is that it's the opposite of spherical in every way. So instead of having too much space, the problem that you have is too little space. And so instead of stretching, you have to shrink. But again, same issue, that there's no way to do it without having long bonds, medium bonds, short bonds, and teeny tiny bonds. And so if I imagine doing this with actual physical atoms, there's no way that I could do this and keep the original type binding Hamiltonian from my abstract hyperbolic space. But if I do it in a circuit QED fashion, I can. And so this is a cartoon of how this works. Um, and so distance is not preserved, but for the circuit QED system, I don't care. The only thing I care about is can I keep my type binding model? And so first, if I use the same capacitors everywhere, that guarantees me that I have the same hopping matrix element. So that keeps the connectivity. And then the last thing that needs to be fixed is exactly what Elizabeth was asking about, which is the on-site energy. So you need the same resonance frequency. And so if you look here near the center of this lattice, there are very large meanders. And if you look here on the outside, there are very small meanders. And that lets you keep the Hamiltonian the same. For the hyperbolic case, it's sort of the opposite, that you do very large meanders towards the middle and, and small ones towards the outside. Sorry, small ones in the middle and large ones to the outside. And this is the, the key that will let us make this kind of a hyperbolic structure. And since graphene is our favorite, we started looking at this, this hyperbolic version of graphene. So it's seven-sided polygons instead of six, but sort of tiling in the same way. And so this is the one that we started to look at. And when we make it in the lab, we're gonna end up with a Kagome-like version. And so we started to think about how do we understand what's going on with particles in this system. So this is the band structure of the Kagome lattice, the Euclidean Kagome lattice with negative hopping. So there's a flat band at minus two shown in orange here, and there's two bands above it. And what we'd like to do is produce the same kind of calculation for the hyperbolic lattice. Unfortunately, mathematics is against us. Hyperbolic geometry is fundamentally non-commutative. And so all of the lattice tricks that we know and love for commuting band structure, they just don't work this way and that way. They don't mean the same thing anymore. So there's no good Brave lattice. There's no good Bloch theory. And so we have to say goodbye to this beautiful plot. And all that we're left with are more general graph theory methods that exploit much less of the lattice symmetry and brute force type binding numerics, where you just take a finite lattice and diagonalize it. And so this is what the output of one of these finite calculations look like. This is a slightly silly piece of data. It's literally just the list of eigenvalues that comes out of the numerical diagonalizer, in this case for the Kagome lattice. And so it's, this is the eigenvalues that you get for a finite chunk of this lattice. And so you can see that the flat band is clearly still visible. The rest of the spectrum is harder to make 
sense of, but you can see the flat fan very clearly. And so we did the same calculation for the hyperbolic lattice at various sizes. And you get something that's qualitatively very similar. There's stuff and there's a flat band, but there's one big difference is that there appears to be this size independent gap between the flat band and the rest of the states. And so this got us very excited because gap flat bands are extremely unusual in the solid state. And they're very interesting from a quantum simulation point of view, because if you look here, all of these states are degenerate. And so that means as soon as you introduce a perturbation, a nonlinearity, an interaction, they can have a huge effect on the flat band and the flat band states. And normally, if you do find a flat band, it's immediately next to a more conventional band and you can't separate them. But in this case, you actually can. And so that was the second thing that got us excited about this particular hyperbolic lattice and made us decide to make this one. So here's what it looks like in practice. This is a photograph of the device. It's niobium on sapphire on a one inch chip. And so what it is, is a central heptagon and two rings of neighbors. So here's the central heptagon, the first ring and the second ring kind of looks like a triple. Um, and it operates at 16 gigahertz. And as was asked earlier, it has these four antenna and these are ports that allow us to do transmission measurements. And so, you know, it took us a while to get the microwave engineering down on this one and to beat down on some systematic disorder, but we were finally able to measure the transmission through this device and roughly match it to theory. So what you're looking at here is experimental transmission in blue and uh, a family of theory curves for different disorder realizations showing that we can match sort of the location of the peaks, some of these big dips and the characteristic widths. Um, for those of you that have seen superconducting device transmission before, this looks pretty ugly. Basically, the issue is that at this frequency, there's some leakage going through the device. And so what you're actually looking at is the interference between the background and the main signal. And that's why you have, for example, these Fano resonances here. But by including that leakage in the simulation, we can verify that we've made the hyperbolic lattice that we wanted to make with a reasonable and livable amount of disorder. So typically two to five megahertz on the resonators. So this is not too bad. And so this was our proof of principle device that we could make this thing. We made it in 2018, 2019. And so what we've been doing since then is really thinking about where do we want to go with this? How do we understand it theoretically? And also what, what other devices would we start to make? and merge with qubits going forward. Um, so I'm about to change gears to a theory topic. So if there are questions, maybe this is another good stopping point. I don't see anything in the chat. All right, then let's do some math. Wait, sorry, can I, I have one question. Okay. Um, <laughs> yep. I, 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 yeah, I should have typed it, but that's my bad. Um, so maybe I missed this, but where exactly are you putting the Joseph's injunctions? So there's no Joseph's injunctions here yet. So the okay. idea is that we want to, to engineer the photonic environment. And so in this case, we just wanted to demonstrate that we really could make this crazy hyperbolic lattice. And going forward, we're trying to figure out what is the lattice that we want to actually couple to qubits, essentially. OK, I see. These are all resonators. This is all resonators. Very cool. OK, thank you. I have a question. The, yep. So this, this gap above the flat band, mm -hmm. was that predicted? Like, did you expect that to be there? I did the numerical simulations and I literally turned around to my lab mate and said, I think I have a bug, but if not, this is really cool. <laughs> we, we had no idea going in that that was going to be there. Um, we've since, if you wait a few slides, I'll tell you exactly where it's from. But it was, I had no patient. idea it was going to be there. It looks like Paul has a question. Just a, a quick one. I'm sorry, I, I missed it. So what are the different theory curves that are on this plot? 
So basically when we make these resonators, there's a little bit of systematic disorder between the different shapes and a little bit of random disorder from fabrication uncertainty. And so when I do a theory simulation, it's never gonna match exactly. So I just did a few realizations with a certain characteristic size and we see that the variations between those cover the data basically. Got it, thanks. Uh, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. uh, so you said there's a coupling between two resonators independent of the distance. I guess that's a, to some degree is a, a approximation, right? So can you comment on that? Yeah, so, so what I would say is that, you know, I ran a lot of simulations for these and what we see is that the, the, the dominant disorder appears to be in the on-site energies. And so there are probably some parasitic capacitance that not all of the hopping comes exactly from this junction region, but I've seen no evidence that, that it's a large fraction and much more evidence that the, the few megahertz variation in the on-site energy is really the dominant energy scale. So one of the sort of the issues is that these resonators are, their fundamental frequency is eight gigahertz. The hopping rate in this device is about 75 megahertz. And so one part in a thousand of the on-site energy is much bigger than one part in a thousand of the hopping energy. And so it's the on-site that tends to dominate things. Okay. All right, cool. So now, now we're going into hardcore theory land. Um, so working together with Alexei Gorshkov's group, we tried to, to understand this device better um, and really get a feel for what would the theory be for a particle on a hyperbolic lattice. And because of this weird minus sign, the fact that the band structure is upside down, the easy part of the spectrum to understand is actually the high energy end because this is where the long wavelength modes live. Um, and so this is where you should, you feel that your lattice should coarse grain out and basically leave you with a hyperbolic particle in a box. And so if you look at the highest energy numerical eigenstate for a finite lattice, this is a plot where what I've done here is drawn a bubble on every lattice site where the size of the bubble is the amplitude of the wave function and the color is the phase. And so this exactly looks like what you would expect for a particle in a box sampled at some lattice sites. Um, and so what Igor, one of Alexei's postdocs, uh, sort of spearheaded was a more quantitative check of this. And so what they did was they looked at the continuum sort of free particle in hyperbolic space and tried to compare it to the lattice. And they were able to show that up to an effective mass, these two are equivalent. And then so what's plotted here in red, I believe, is the Green's function on the lattice. And in black is the continuum Green's function sampled at the lattice points, showing that they are in very good agreement, basically confirming the intuition that we always had, which is that a, a particle moving on this lattice was a hyperbolic particle. And they matched the Green's function, the ground state, ground state meaning highest excited state, and the first excited state energies. Um, so that's our sort of hyperbolic theory. But in addition to the hyperbolicness of this lattice, as I said, we were interested in it for the gap flat band. And so I also started working very hard thinking, can we understand where this gap is coming from? And can we make it bigger, more robust to experimental imperfections? Because the, the gap in the heptagon Kagome hyperbolic lattice is actually not that big. And we've actually made a lot of progress on that front. I was working with Peter Sarnak in the math department at Princeton, and we've really managed to get a good handle on where this gap is coming from. And it turns out that the key really is that this is a line graph lattice. And so what does it mean to have a line graph lattice? We've seen a couple of examples. So the most famous one is graphene and its line graph being the Kagome. And so the line graph is basically, you start with some, some graph and you, and you say exactly what is the lattice where my new lattice sites are the edges of the old graph. And so if you look at this hexagon in graphene, it turns into this rotated hexagon in the Kagome. 
And then the other thing is that these three-way junctions each turn into triangles. So this is the general line graph procedure. We've seen graphene and kagome, or what I call heptagon graphene and heptagon kagome. Um, but this is actually a very general graph theoretic operation. I can apply it to any graph that I want. So for example, the tree or something with a higher coordination number like the square lattice. In the case of the square lattice, I get a slightly more unusual line graph. So the thing is that this four-way junction, the resonators neighboring each other are connected, but also opposite. And so that gives you these plaquettes with diagonal hoppings. There's no site in the middle that's a, a crossing of the bonds. It's an optical illusion. So these are sort of examples of a line graph lattice. And these two in the middle are hyperbolic. And they're very hard to calculate. But graphene and the square lattice, those I know what to do with. And so we can take a look at those two and try to get some intuition. So here we have graphene and its band structure its line graph is the Kagome lattice, and that's the band structure of the Kagome. And if we do the same thing for the square lattice, we get this picture. And I have deliberately used an extremely suggestive color code to highlight a pattern here. But if you look over here, at these two band structures on the right, you see that they each have a flat band at minus two. And then the non-flat bands look identical to the ones that you started with in the original. Both for Kagome and Graphene and for the square lattice and its line graph. And this is not accidental. This is in fact a completely general statement about line graphs of regular graphs. Um, and I'll take you through the math in a minute, but what the math will allow us to do is to really understand where this flat band is coming from and how to pull it away from the dispersive bands, because in both of these cases, there's a band touch. All right, so now we have to do some math. And so what we want to do is connect the Hamiltonian of a particle hopping on the original graph to the Hamiltonian, the effective Hamiltonian for photons on the lattice. Um, there's one slight subtlety here, which is that there are two on-site wave functions for these resonators. There's a half wave mode, which is anti-symmetric, and a full wave mode, which is symmetric. Uh, the full wave mode gives you an S wave type binding model on the line graph. Um, half wave mode is interesting, but much messier. And so we won't talk about that here. And so we wanna connect these two Hamiltonians, the Hamiltonian on the original to the Hamiltonian on the line graph. And to do so, we're gonna borrow an operator from graph theory called the incidence operator, which maps states on the original graph to states on the line graph. You can think of it as a rectangular matrix where you input a vertex or a node and it outputs the edges that are connected to that node. And so M goes one way and M transpose maps the other way back from the line graph to the graph. And so these are the, the magic golden relations. So basically if you apply M and M transpose, then you go from the graph to the line graph and back. And if you do it the other way, M transpose M, then you go from the line graph to the graph and back again. And what you find on the right hand side is if you do it in the first order, you get the original Hamiltonian plus this matrix D. And D is a diagonal matrix of the coordination numbers. So for something like graphene, this is three times the identity. And if you do it the other way, you get the effective Hamiltonian that we're interested in plus two times the identity and M and M transpose are adjoint. And so what happens is that these two orders of operation, they have the same eigenvalues except for the kernel of the larger operator. And so neglecting the kernel, we see that these two things are essentially equal. So you take the original plus three and you get the new one plus two for something like graphene. To be a little bit more accurate, you have a relationship like this, which says that every energy on the new lattice either comes from the kernel of MM transpose, which is the flat band at minus two, or is an original energy shifted up by D minus two. And so what this now tells us is that the, what we need to understand is the minimum of the energies on the original graph. 
because those are the things that are going to be close to the flat band. And that if we can understand the minimum energy on the original graph, then we'll be able to really control what's going on with the flat band in the line graph. And so now we can go back to our table of examples and see how this works. So for graphene, the density of states is supported on minus 3,3. 3. I haven't drawn the exact density of states, just the interval where it lives. And when you take the line graph, it shifts up to minus 2,4. And the flat band appears at four. And the same thing happens for each of these. You take the original density of states, you shift it up, and you put in a flat band. And this is true whether it's a Euclidean lattice that I can compute a band structure for, or whether it's an arbitrary graph. This is a general statement for regular graphs. Um, we can also relate what's going on in the flat band. So in the Kagome lattice, the flat band is formed because you have these compact support localized states. So this guy is non-zero on six sites. And so red is plus, yellow is minus. This is plus, minus, plus, minus. And it can't hop because of destructive interference on these triangles. And this is the guy that produces the flat band. You get the same thing on the square lattice, except the destructive interference is in this triangle. Um, the, tr the tree and heptagon kagome are a little bit more complicated. This one, because it has no loops, gives you an exponential decay. And then this one is fun. It took us a long time to figure out what was going on here, because if you have a seven-sided loop, you can't just make this plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. And so what happens is it has to fill out this larger 14-sided loop to make the flat band states. But, so now we know what's going on. We know what states are in the flat band, why it's flat. It's exactly this fact that it's penned in by the triangles and can't hop. And we now know that if we want to get flat band, we need to start with a lattice that has no states near minus D. And graphene and the square lattice don't have this property, but the tree and the heptagon kagome lattice do. And this is why we saw that gap flat band there, at least to first order. And so then what we wanted to find was a Euclidean example where this was true. And so the key is that graphene and the square lattice are what's known as bipartite graphs. That means that they can be divided into two sublattices, the yellow and the red, and you can make a wave function that's positive on the red sites and negative on the yellow sites and all neighbors are opposite sign. And this guarantees, sorry, and this guarantees that you have a state at minus three. Whereas if you have a non-bipartite lattice with odd-sided loops, then you can't make this plus minus plus minus pattern. And so what we need is a non-bipartite Euclidean lattice. The canonical example of this is the triangular lattice. Unfortunately, if we want to make the line graph of the triangular lattice, we need a completely symmetric six-way capacitor, which is not possible. And so what we've done instead is use some more graph theory tricks to make a good example from graphene. So here we have graphene and a cut through its band structure. And I'm going to play a trick and do what I call subdivision. So we put a new lattice site on the middle of every edge. This actually square roots the band structure. It's kind of fun. So it turns this quadratic minimum into a Dirac cone. But then if I take the line graph of that, now I have this new lattice. I call it caffeine as a joke. It's partway kagome and partway graphene. Um, and it's very special because like graphene that it started from, every site has three neighbors. So this makes it very good for a hardware layout. We can make it easily. And that also means that when you do the band structure, the energies can be anywhere between minus three and three. But if you actually do the calculation, there are no states below minus two. And so if we start for this guy as the hardware, then when we take its line graph, that will shift up like so and leave a hole at the bottom. And so now I think my laser pointer is going to get in the way, but we have a flat band at minus two and a giant band gap of 1t before any other states come in. And one of the things where I was able, we were able to prove with Peter is that actually this is the largest possible gap that you can get starting from any three regular hardware layout. 
And so we can make fun things like this for the gap where the flat band is by itself. Sort of amusingly, if you keep going with this procedure, you can get this band all by itself also. So we had a lot of fun playing around with the subdivision and line graph. Um, and in fact, we were able to prove some new math results. Um, so now I'm going to try to take a few minutes and just describe what we've been up to. But so we were motivated by this question, can we use these methods of subdivision and line graph and combining all of our band structure calculation knowledge from physics with math to understand if we could make even larger gaps or if we could make planar graphs have gaps in the right places as well because constraining things to be planar is a pretty severe restriction in graph theory um, and so we've proved one theorem in a which is an archive preprint at the moment that no three regular graph can have a gap larger than two and we've actually found two examples that obey this property so this is the first one and this is the second one it has a gap minus one one I think physics audience will be intrigued because it took us a while to see what this guy is, but it has another incarnation, otherwise known as a carbon nanotube. So this is one of the smallest carbon nanotubes and has provably got the biggest gap of any three regular graph. Okay, so we're having fun. We're on a roll. So we kept going and started looking at whether we could do all of this in planar graphs because the previous one extremal ones weren't planar and so the interesting thing that we found here was an idea that peter had um, which is a different way of viewing lattices and this is the technique that we leveraged um, and so the name for this in math is called an abelian cover and so the basic idea is you start with some small graph and then you want to build a lattice out of copies of it and so you take one edge, for example, this one, and you cut it and then you stitch it not within the unit cell, but to the equivalent site, one unit cell over. And so this is the kind of thing that you get when you do this. This is with two edges stitched. So this particular one and this particular one. And what's really nice about this method is a couple of things. So one is actually the eigenvalues of this small graph are the k equals zero eigenvalues of the full lattice. No matter what lattice you make, how many edges you stitch or in how many dimensions, this, this guy gives you the k equals zero points in the bands. And small graphs like this have been tabulated and their spectra are known. So this is like having a periodic table of unit cells. You want a gap at a certain energy, you can throw away all of the unit cells that don't start with that gap and then try to find lattices that have big gaps. Um, so I'm running short on time, so I'll skip ahead a little bit. We found lots of fun ones, um, but maybe of more interest to the physics audience is that this actually has connections to error correcting codes. So recently Steve Flamia and his student Adrian Chapman proved this theorem here, which is that if you have a spin model and you want to solve it exactly by transforming to free fermions, you can do that if and only if the anti-commutation relations form a line graph. So that's how we started talking to each other was this line graph connection. Um, but it turns out that if you want to solve this, then the, the equivalent free fermion model is a magnetic model on the root graph. And the gap at half filling tells you about the robustness of this error correcting code. And so what we've been doing is actually using this abelian cover method to try to find lattices that have large gaps in this sense. And so we're checking the carbon nanotubes and we find sort of once you add this magnetic field aspect, you get new, new options. But like this is our extremal example from before and it has a very large gap, but it turns out not actually to be the ground state of the code. Whereas an example like this has a very large gap and it is the ground state. And so we're very excited about exploring those connections and we have a manuscript in preparation. And I think I'm desperately running out of time to tell you anything about interacting devices. So I'll just give you a very high level pitch for this. But the basic idea is that if you put superconducting qubits 
in a photonic crystal like this, then you get a photon mediated qubit qubit interaction, which is a natively sort of a swap. One qubit emits a photon, the other one absorbs it, and they, they trade. And if you do this in a single cavity, then this is in an infinite range all-to-all -all interaction, which is relatively boring. And if you want to make something more interesting, you need more modes. And the interference between the different modes gives you some form of wave packet or interaction profile. And if you do this in a 1D photonic crystal, you get an exponentially localized interaction. Um, and so this has actually been measured in the Hout group, but I will blaze through that. And so basically what we want to do is go to new interaction profiles, not this extremely localized simple exponential, but go to something more interesting. And there's two ways to do that. One is to start plugging qubits into the lattices that I showed you earlier. For example, the flat bands will give you a frustrated magnetism. Um, the other way to make something like this is to go to a more elaborate coupling scheme. Um, and so if you have Raman coupling, then you can imagine that you drive one leg actively and use a cavity to mediate the other. And so you get the same effective swap type interaction, but there are two detunings now that control everything, the intermediate state detuning and the Raman detuning. And what this allows you to do is to put multiple drives together and so if you do multiple drives in a simple 1D photonic crystal, you can superimpose different profiles. And that's really the key of this method is that with multiple drives, you can just add the interaction that you would get individually from drive. And in 1D, you can make an approximate power law interaction. But in order to do this, you need a three-level qubit. Um, and so this is why we're looking at fluxonium I think for this audience, I will just skip through the details of fluxonium and you'll have to take my word for it that it's a three level qubit. Um, and so we've done a few uh, preliminary experiments. And so the idea here is that we have a single fluxonium in a cavity and we just want to demonstrate this cavity mediated Raman process. And so what we've done is we've driven uh, Rabi oscillations where we apply one leg only and rely on the cavity to do the other. And so experimentally, what this means is that we pulse far detuned from the excited state, and then we check if we've depleted the G1 population. And lo and behold, if you drive at the right frequency with increasing power, you can drive the population to the G2 state and back again. And so this is a pi pulse three pi pulse, four, five pi pulse, and so on. And so that we've shown that you can have this basic interaction. And so what we're working on now is getting a proper two qubit device to demonstrate this. And there, now you can see how messy life actually is when you do this. Two qubits, a coupling resonator, readout, and many, many, many wire bonds. Um, and so in conclusion, I've hopefully convinced you that circuit QED lattices can make very, very interesting artificial materials and that we have sort of natural access to lattices that aren't typically available in solid state. So things like the hyperbolic lattice that's really forbidden and then things like caffeine, which are very interesting, but it's hard to convince molecules to just spontaneously form a 2D layer of this type. Um, and so that we're very much looking forward to doing these sort of power law and dynamical interactions with the Raman process, many body physics in the flat bands, and then just really enjoying the connections that came between all of this physics and all of this math. And then I'm particularly fond of the fact that my excursions into math land have actually come back to physics with this connection to error correcting codes. Um, and I, I must end by thanking all of my partners in crime, um, Andrew Hauck, my postdoc advisor, Peter Sarnak, who's done all of this crazy math with me. Alexei is the sort of theory PI on some of the hyperbolic work and uh, the Raman project with these two excellent postdocs, Adrian and Steve are the superconducting guys and Matthias, was the graduate student that I conned into making hyperbolic lattices with me the first time, my dear friend and colleague in soldiering through that. Thank you. And
jobs. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alicia. That was an excellent talk. There was even math that I understood. Um, <laughs> I appreciate. Um, so does anyone have questions? Nobody put anything in the chat, but we've had a lot of people just pipe in. Give other people an opportunity. So um, the connections to the error correcting codes. Yes. Um, the, uh, um, how do I want to ask this? So is, is the idea that it's just kind of the same math that you're doing and so you can use what the mathematical tools that you've developed for these error correcting codes or is the idea actually that there's a physical implementation of error correcting codes using these types of systems? So this is more that the math that we did for understanding the lattices is actually very useful for these error correcting codes. Um, so what it turns out, and this is where, you know, we're getting to the edges of the things that I know, but that you take this spin model and you can, you want to do the free fermion correspondence and sort of for, you have a bunch of stabilizers in the spin model essentially. And for each eigenvalue of the stabilizers, you get a different magnetic model on the unit, on the, the root graph. And so it's, you take the original lattice and you want to orient each edges, each edge and different orientations correspond to different eigenvalues of the stabilizers. Um, and being a lowly experimentalist, I don't know how to do oriented graphs, but if I multiply by I, then I get plus I and minus I in the hopping. And I understand this is a Pyrrhus phase and I say, okay, this is magnetism. I, <laughs> I vaguely understand this. And so basically we were able to use the same codes that I had for hunting for these large band gaps in regular graphs and just anti-symmetrize the Hamiltonian and look for large gaps in the, in the free fermion Hamiltonians. And when we started, we were originally thinking, oh, I already know where all the big gaps are. Um, and so what was sort of interesting is what we ended up finding is that knowing where the big gaps are for, for the symmetric version doesn't actually help you. Um, and so that there are cases where there's a big gap, but it's not the ground state. Um, and this is an example where the symmetric case has no gap at all, but the ground state has a huge gap. And so we're just sort of building intuition for how these things correspond. And what we were really using was this table that we found in the back of a book, all three regular graphs up to 12 vertices. <laughs> That one looks promising. Okay, plug that into the code. And at this point, I had codes that could try all square 2D lattices of this stuff. Um, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, for looking at these lattices and basically um, the code helps you find where there's a large gap and there's a ground state and that tells you whether this mapping actually works to the quantum error correcting codes. Um, if I were to change the lattice somewhat, so let's say like if I distort the lattice, um, could I make changes to the lattice to try to optimize the size of the gap and maybe make the code more robust? I, I think you can. Um, I haven't looked at it yet, basically just because it makes the problem sort of much higher dimensional. Um, you know, but so the canonical example of this free fermion solvable uh, code of this type is the Kataev honeycomb. And that doesn't have a gap unless you make the couplings unequal. Um, and so what we were, you know, what I had sort of been thinking is that these gaps are much, much larger than what you would get from slightly anti-symmetrizing the Kataev honeycomb. So this may be a better starting point. Um, you know, it, what it turns out is there's a fairly fundamental tension between having a very large single particle gap and having a 2D code. Um, and so we're really trying to explore sort of what these trade-offs are. So the, 
then would you say that the gaps that you found are sort of getting close to the limit that you would get with like a 2D? Uh, so what, what we really found is there's two gaps that matter. So one is this very obvious single particle gap. So that, let me just say, let's look at this one, for example. So if you, oops, go back. Um, so if you look at this and you say, okay, at half filling, I fill all of these states and none of these. So this gap is huge, it's two hoppings. And I believe that this is the biggest that you could ever do. Can't quite prove it, but I'm pretty sure. The problem is that this isn't the only gap that matters. You have to compare the different possible orientations of the graph. So for example, this one to that one. And, and what it turns out is that that comparison tends to give you a much smaller gap than these really big ones. So we know how to make the single particle gap very large, but this the sector comparison gap, we don't actually know how to make it big. And so, so far in these cases, that's always the small one. Okay. So then it might not matter that this gap tends to be smaller in a 2D code because other things ruin it first. But sort of these are the kinds of things that we're exploring and we certainly haven't found a smoking gun example that's good in everything. Because what we'd really want is a 2D code with a huge single particle gap and a huge gap between the sector. Okay, thanks. All right. So thanks a lot, Alicia. Let's thank again.